Sure. All right. Who wants to go first today? Who, who else is on here? Uh, Howard's on. David's on. I don't see Seth yet. I don't okay. know if Peter's I'm, on. I'm trying to prep one more case. So, David, I'll do you have cases? Next. next. Jeff, I've been unable to get cases because I get throttled when I try to download. <laughs> okay. How, what about Howard? Sorry, none this week. Okay. Well, I can start then. I've got some I can start with. Uh, let's see here. No, that's not what I want to do. Okay, so this is a 21-year-old female um, who presented, let's see if I can find the right image there, presented to an uh, emergency department. I believe she had a cough and some, some chest discomfort, and this was her chest radiograph. And we zoom up in it. You can see not much going on there. Uh, we'll pay attention to this area. If we go look on the lateral, you can see that, you know, maybe something back in here, but that's always a tough spot. You've got some ribs coming in there. So, but it'd be very easy to just pass this one as nothing. I think that's very reasonable. So she went, underwent an MR angio for uh, possible pulmonary embolism. And this is the uh, early phase scan. And We'll see as we go posteriorly, there's this area that's of non-enhancing lung on the coronal. And then if we go to a later phase, go back posteriorly there, we'll see again, this area of non-enhancing lung and a little bit of tissue around the left hilum there. And I'll go to, a, this is a bit later in the phase. So now we're more like what we typically see on a chest CT and we can see there's some thickening around the left hilum along the structures, and then posteriorly, again, this area of non-enhancement. So uh, I'll put this in an axial plane just to, for familiarity. So we can see right here is a little enhancing nodule, the area of decreased perfusion around it, and then some modest enlargement of the bronchial and hilar lymph nodes there. So at this point, then a chest CT was done. And let me see if I can get the timing right. Oops, 2019. Yeah, here we go. So we can see there's a little nodule in the left lower lobe right there, followed by a larger nodule. And then switch to the soft tissue. You can see there's some enlargement of those lymph nodes. So this is. What we often see with granulomatous infection, especially histoplasmosis, would be a decent look for that. So presumptive, presumptive of an endemic fungal infection. Uh, she ended up getting a workup, and this actually turned out to be um, blastomycosis, which, um, as I've shown cases in the past, this is a very unusual manifestation. There it is later on. You can see after treatment, it's getting smaller. This is a follow-up scan showing that finding there. So, uh, you know, if you look at the cases of blast I've shown, they usually present with consolidation, masses, cavities, and lymphadenopathy is very uncommon. And so this was a very unusual case in that it actually looked like histoplasmosis, so a very mild case of blastomycosis there. So um, probably more prudent to call it uh, granulomatous infection, but there's the lymphadenopathy for everybody on the, on the contrasted image, and there's the nodule. So add blasto into the differential diagnosis for solitary nodules. Now, Jeff, that was in the summer, wasn't it? That was a, a July yes. case? It was, uh, yes. So yeah, we, and we see it year round. There is a lag. We see it in January because um, it can smolder for a couple of months. Um, so presumably she was infected sometime in the early summer or late spring. All right, this is something that I hadn't seen before. Um, and this patient was um, uh, had a malignancy, I don't remember what, um, and had a port catheter placed. It also has a malignant pleural effusion. 
And you'll notice on this chest radiograph um, that this port, which was placed elsewhere, has a slightly unusual course and in that its uh, intrathoracic portion is too medial. Uh, should be here in the SVC. Um, otherwise, it looks like it's a tunneled, typical tunnel port, uh, tunneled under here, and then it's an, uh, it should be an IJ insertion. So um, the patient had a CT as part of this malignant pleural fusion evaluation. There's the port coming in, but we'll see that right here, it accesses the carotid artery and not the vein, and then proceeds to extend into the aortic arch, and all the way into the ascending aorta. And I've never, I, we've seen central lines in the arteries before, you know, under ultrasound, it's sometimes easy to access the artery unintentionally. You go through and through the vein, especially if the patient has uh, depleted intravascular volume or is hypotensive. Um, but this is the first time I've ever seen a port. I don't know, David, have you ever seen one? You see a lot of ports out in Seattle. I don't know if I've seen a port go this way, but I've seen other catheters get yeah. into jugular. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, the yeah, I don't know how this happened. It was done somewhere else, but um, usually you do them under fluoro, at least, you know, confirm the placement. So um, always have to... It's have so it's always outside. Now, was this a plavian or a jugular? It was a jugular approach, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was a tunneled, tunneled approach. You can see that's above the yeah. clavicle. Yeah, yeah. You, Jeff, can you show the lateral? Yeah. We'll see. I mean, not that you need it, but tougher to tell, huh? Usually yeah, they're exactly. more interior. They usually come more like this. Oh. It just yeah, that's a great example. All right, so this this case is a conundrum here. Let's see. Um, so this is a 69 year old female. Let me get the timing right here. Yep, who had some sort of form of acute lung injury. I think it was drug induced. I I think I don't honestly remember the details of it. I got more distracted by the interesting findings. So she had the CT at presentation. Looks like a acute lung injury, some pleural effusion, some mild edema, but. Uh, nothing very exciting, but keep an eye on the, the airways and the orientation of the right upper lobe here. And incidentally detected on a scan performed about a month later was this abnormal configuration. I'll put them side by side. So this was presentation, and this is a month later. And so we're at the level of the aortic arch. And you'll see that there's this unusual orientation of this fissure. The acute lung injury has improved. And then as we go down, we'll see that the right upper lobe bronchus, which we should be seeing already, is acutely narrowed. And then beyond it, we see the middle lobe bronchus and the lower lobe bronchus origins there. And the middle lobe bronchus is actually heading up north. And so this looks like this is the upper lobe bronchus and it's heading posteriorly and is occluded here. So, and then all of the fissures are in an unusual orientation, you can see the oblique fissure on the left is way here. We should be seeing it out there on the right, but we're seeing it back here. So this is a spontaneous torsion. I think I showed you one a years ago of a guy with an infection who developed a spontaneous torsion. She's had no lung surgery. Um, the only thing I was looking at is on her, her previous scan, you see there's the oblique fissure, but you don't really see there's a little bit of a horizontal fissure there, but it's a very small one, it's incomplete. It's more complete out in the lateral component, but medially you don't see much of it. So what's happened is the upper lobe um, has collapsed posteriorly. The middle lobe has slid in here, and I'll show some multiplanar reformats. And then the lower lobe has swung anteriorly and filled the space where the middle lobe is. So if we go to a sagittal view, I'll put the uh, axial here for, cross-reference, go the right way. We can see that the strange orientation of the fissures. So we've got the lower lobe filled in here. This is the upper lobe and the middle lobe is filled in up top. So this is a just a very unusual case. And they decided actually not to intervene on the patient because she was asymptomatic, believe it or not. Wow. And Sorry, I missed the first part. Did she have radiation or something, or what's? No, it's a it was a drug induced lung injury. Really? Wow. Because the other one. Huh. 
Huh. I would yeah. have guessed that that was radiation pneumonitis, which is now evolved into fibrosis because it's so geographic on that more yeah, recent one. Yeah, but you can see she had a lot wow. of disease on the other side too. Yeah, that would be a lot of radiation pneumonitis. It would be, uh, there's no port that's that big. Yeah, that would be a fatal dose probably to the lung. Yeah. Or just yeah, yeah an abscapal yeah. effect outside yeah. of the so, so, outside of the port. But yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. So um, you know, there are rare reports of spontaneous lung torsion, usually related to uh surgery uh, or some sort of instrumentation. But I did show a case years ago of one patient had an it was instantly picked up um as a as a torsion. He had an effusion and an infection, and the thought was is there were the between the effusion and the density of the infection, it sort of tossed everything, pushed the lung up and flipped on its, flipped over 90 degrees. So it's about a 90 degree torsion, but yeah. So Jeff, it looks as if there was pleural effusion here too. So the, yeah. there might've been a big pleural effusion that floated everything into abnormal locations. It is and then they got possible. stuck. It got stuck there when the effusion dried up. Yeah. And left the, left the upper lobe sticking to the back, the back chest wall. Yeah, that's a good thought. And I think the other important point is that you know you have to follow the airways on every scan um, because you know the orientation of the airways can tell you so much. And interestingly, um, you know, I, I'm going to show another case where uh, the CT really made the diagnosis because um, you can miss torsion sometimes on bronchoscopy if your orientation is off because if everything moves in the same direction, the the relative relationships are the same. So this is a Another case, and I won't go through all the radiographs, but this was a patient who was two years out, and we actually uh, published this case, I think, back in 2009 or maybe 10. This was a patient who was two months out from a lung transplant and was not doing well and uh, came in with uh, imaging looking like this, and you can see the um, there's the left anastomosis, and I hope I grabbed the right scans, but you can see, again, there's the anastomosis. Um, I think this may be the wrong one. Yeah, I may have grabbed the wrong scan. Bummer. I think I grabbed the wrong nice one. Nice pericardium, nonetheless. Yeah, no, I grabbed the wrong one, a label. This is another <laughs> one. Well, I can show you this one. Oh, yeah, no, no, this is, no, no, I'm, this is correct. This is not a torsion. This is a different thing. So, yeah, this patient's two months out and is not doing well, and you can see, yes, there's pneumopericardium, beautiful example clean gas, not streaky like pneumomediastinum, but is actually um, having some anastomotic problems. And so uh, um, so what you want to see is here is the anastomosis, and you can see that um, right there is a defect. And I'll make, I'll put up the coronal. And you can see this, what looks like almost like a cardiac bronchus there, but that's actually an uh, anastomotic defect here. And then on the other side, you can see there's some debris in the airway and just a little bit of irregularity along it. Um, um, so they did bronch the patient and on the um, bronchoscopy, the uh, pulmonologist was telling me that uh, this entire, uh, this was just a big defect, uh, just all necrotic there, just a very unhappy looking, uh, you know, sort of ischemic injury to this whole anastomosis. And then on this side, this little sloughed area in here, you see a little defect right there. This whole anterior wall was sort of devascularized as well. So, you know, these are less common nowadays, but they do occur. And I think one of the reasons, and because a lot of these anastomoses, um, um, at least the venous ones are intrapericardial, you can have persistent pneumopericardium. But, you know, on top of it, you have this acute lung injury here, probably graft, uh, primary graft dysfunction, um, or just some bad uh, rejection, pleural fusion still having plural space problems. And interesting, this sort of OP looking stuff up here, which, uh, you know, hopefully it wasn't COVID-19, but uh, doubt it at that time, but um, it has that organizing pneumonia look. So just very unhappy graphs. Um, and then you have to watch these anastomoses very carefully because they can, the dehiscence can be very subtle, but right there and right there. I think I, yeah. And that's the, uh, yep, that's in my cases. I thought I had a different uh, torsion case. I'll have to bring it next week. Thank you. So one, one also wonders whether there's a relationship between those uh, dehiscences and the pericardial air so that if you do have leakage of air into the mediastinum, there is a potential pathway by which mediastinal air can go into the pericardial space. 
And maybe that's the etiology of the pericardial air, which is hard to explain otherwise, right? Yeah. And a lot of times with the double transplants, um, you do see communication anteriorly between the pericardium and the pleural spaces when they open it all up to do the anastomosis. So, but this is two months out. So I think Howard's thought is really good on that. Yeah, there's a communication between the mediastinum and the pericardial space one, I think. Okay. All right, Travis, are you ready? Yeah, I've got plenty of cases. All right. Who I else is, is Peter going to show stuff today? I just have one today. Okay. So you and I can do it at the end if there's time. Okay, and I can add I've got, one. I've got five or six loaded. Okay. You see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, we'll start with the a lung cancer screening. And I think this is a, a one that's a sneaky case. And a good example, this was picked up on the outside and then sent to us for surgery. See, the patient has an incidental aberrant right subclavian artery. There, are, let's see if I can change the window. There's a, probably a little bit of smoking related fibrosis, like a little bit of reticulation. And then as you get more to posterior, a little bit of maybe some airspace enlargement with fibrosis. And this was 2019. And I think you could, I would excuse anyone, myself probably included, that just says maybe there's a little bit of atelectasis and fibrosis there. Then they come back this year, and you'll see, if I can get this sink turned off. Yeah, so that has grown. And you can see that this is was started as a small adenocarcinoma and has now grown into a slightly larger adenocarcinoma. So a little bit of a scary one. And I think it shows the benefits of, of annual screening in these patients. Because even if you say, I don't know, let's say you are worried about this, what category would you give it anyway? How would you guys score this prospectively? Mm. Yeah, I know. I mean, the, the good news is it's, you know, it's mostly ground glass. There's a little bit of consolidation there, and there is certainly a little bit of fibrosis. And so they took this out. There was some respiratory bronchiolitis and, and some smoking-related fibrosis, and then a small adenocarcinoma. And it's one of these ones that had about 5% micropapillary, so it could unfortunately be a, a bad actor and be relatively aggressive in the future. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if this were baseline how I would score this. But just throwing that one out there is, is an interesting and, and kind of scary one. You know, these, these, um, these cancers in fibrosis are tricky, as has been pointed out in this conference before. Yeah. Travis, this is Daniela. Um, even even if you, I mean, if you measure the solid component, it was going to be less than six millimeters, right? If you imagine everything else is atelectasis. Yeah. I mean, we have lung rats too, and come back next year. Yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe the best you could, the most you could say is is eight, but again, it's like, like David is saying too, I mean, how much of this is, you know, fibrosis, certainly it's asymmetric, some of it's ground glass. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's why I, I, I don't say that, you know, certainly nothing was done wrong here. And in fact, you know, it was done right that they picked it up when you can still intervene on this. So it's just a, a sneaky one, but I think to David's point too, I always get nervous especially in patients in our big ILD population, when you have anyone getting scanned and has it, something new that looks like this in a background of fibrosis, particularly UIP, you get really worried. And those certainly would follow up on a three to six month basis. Yeah. All right, this one, I don't have a, a radiograph for this, but if you saw a radiograph, you would see that there's left upper lobe consolidation. And this was a patient who originally was had shortness of breath and hemoptysis and was diagnosed with pneumonia a few months ago. This didn't go away, which prompted the CT. And we can see that there is ground glass and consolidation. It's confined to the left upper lobe entirely. And you could see there's a little bit of, of septal thickening in here. And I think it's a very important reminder especially if there's viewers on here that 
you know, aren't doing this on a day-to-day -day basis like we are, whenever you see something like this, always look at the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. And in this case, the pulmonary veins in particular, it's nice to do a, just a quick little check. And here you can see the left inferior pulmonary vein. And there's a little clue to what actually happened in this case. And you can see there's tiny little waste right here. Right-sided pulmonary veins are okay. And then the left superior pulmonary vein is completely obstructed here. And so this is venous edema and if, or venous infarction, if you will, from a patient that had undergone an ablation. So the ablation was month, I don't know what time before the radiograph and the pneumonia, but of course, it's just a nice reminder, especially in the days of COVID now that you know, there are other ca causes for ground glass and consolidation. This one, I have uh, some correlates here too, and you can see this is the, the cath that they did. So they've gone IVC, transseptal puncture, and I think this is them trying to engage the left superior pulmonary vein here. And this is the injection, and you just get a little bit of, a little bit of a, a dead end there. They were able to get a wire across it, and now you can see that that thrombus there. And so they treated this with a stent, and now you can see nice flow from that left superior pulmonary vein. So this was just a few days ago. I don't have a, a follow-up radiograph to show that the venous edema has improved yet, but hopefully, and we expect it will. Very nice case. Very nice case, yeah. I don't, yeah, what's your experience? I, we seem to be seeing fewer pulmonary vein stenoses and occlusions after after uh, ablation. Is, do you guys think that's true, just with improvements in technique? Agreed. Yeah, I haven't seen many cases. I mean, I saw a lot more, you know, 12, 13, 14 years ago. Okay, now this one, this is a case I posted on Twitter as I've had more time to actually, you know, Jeff's ahead of me, but I'm learning how to, to get involved with social media here. This is a patient who came in and he's a schizophrenic who was found down and had a pulseless left lower extremity. You can see there's a big clot right here and his profunda femoris is occluded here and he has a little bit of gas in his soft tissue and his had significant myonecrosis in his lower extremity. So that's how he came in and he got a CT for that. And you can see, this is, these are his lung bases. At the same time, then the rest of the chest was imaged. And you can see he's got symmetric bilateral peripheral ground glass opacities, a little, maybe, few little perilobular areas of consolidation, a little bit of organization perhaps. And so of course this, our resident astutely picked this up and, and called everyone and put them on COVID alert. So as the story unfolds, he's now COVID negative times three PCRs. He has had negative viral panels times two. He was, he had an elevated white count at the time of admission, so not leukopenia. And he was also asymptomatic from a respiratory standpoint. You can see he has underlying paraseptal emphysema and probably some smoking related fibrosis as well. So I guess the big question is at what point do you chalk this up to something else? And this is you know, something that we're all gonna be faced with because not every single person that comes in the ER is going to have COVID. And I think it's important that we think about the other things this could be. So his CK levels is cre uh, creatine, kinase levels were in like the 30,000s. And so I'm wondering, you know, is this just organizing pneumonia and a, some degree of lung injury from his just systemic state of, of lower ex extremity necrosis? And I'm curious what you guys think about that. This is the follow-up. They did not do a repeat chest, but this is the follow-up uh, abdomen and pelvis runoff. And you can see persistent, maybe a little bit of, of evolution here and a little less ground glass and maybe a little bit more organization at this point. But, you know, these are the ones I, I honestly don't know what to do with. I would just chalk it up to, you know, some sort of lung injury from a systemic illness, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. That's what I like. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's something, I think it's something blood borne in this distribution, this basal predominant uh, peripheral stuff tells us that this is some evil humor being carried in the bloodstream and then damaging the lung when it arrives. 
an embolic distribution. Yeah. That was some yeah. introduction. And, but did you say that he had an arterial thrombotic occlusion? Yeah. He here. I'll show you that. That's what started all of this. You'll see he had he had an acute. He's a he's a heavy smoker. You can see he has acute thrombus here in the left common iliac. It extends into the external iliac, and then his profunda femoris on the left is completely out. And he had he has other issues with peripheral vascular de disease further down. You can see his superficial femoral is out right here. Because it sort of rings a bell. I don't think I've seen a case, but I seem to remember hearing about or reading a case report of lung edema, presumably a form of acute lung injury edema, complicating an extremity arterial perfusion abnormality. So later today, we can go on Google and see if we can find that case report, but it sort of rings a bell that that entity has been described with arterial lower limb ischemia and reported lung edema of some kind. Yeah. I think, I think. That it's I, just, I have not heard of that. I like um, it. I mean, I think we're all thinking along the sim similar lines. This is something else that's secondarily involving the lungs. So, Travis? Um, yeah. Did he have kidney injury too? Did he have mild myoglobin problems with a kidney and myoglobin nerve and things like that? I don't know. His, I'll, I'll look. I mean, all I know is his, his CK was was super. Actually, his LD, his lactate level here. I've got. Let's see. AST was elevated. There's no there's no comment on the um, on myoglobin. But you know, I think that a lot of people that were viewing this and responding to it were asking why was the CT done in the first place, and I think that's a very valid question. But I think it's also once you have the CT and you have this information during this outbreak, that's that's a, a moot point and a different argument. It's like, what the heck do you do with the information now that you have it? You know, our yeah. David, what are yeah. your infectious disease teams saying about your PCR specificity? Because our ID folks are saying somewhere 80, 85 percent. Well, I don't know what the gold standard is. I don't think that people have calculated it up here. Um, since it's only just ramped up in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, that Chinese article that was, it had the commentary in the journal implied 63% sensitivity from nasal yeah. scope. So it's not, it's not perfect, and I, but I don't know what the gold standard is. Well, I mean, it is, that's the thing. I think it is the best gold standard we have right now because it's testing amplified portions of the RNA from the, from the you know, from the virus. Our, we do a pooled nasal and oropharyngeal one. So they take two samples and put them in the same test, which is supposed yeah. to increase sensitivity. Again, yeah, I don't know. This is, I'm just relying on what they keep saying here that it's somewhere they think 80, 85%. I mean, even if it's, if you say 70% with three negatives, you're looking at what, a, maybe a three? I can't, I'm, it'd be whatever. So, so Travis, this guy didn't yeah. come into the breath. I don't think this is. Um, I don't think that this is uh, COVID. I mean, I think you've got very good yeah. reasons of this abnormal CT. Yeah. And, um, I think. Yeah. You know, one thing that would help is just to see if he's lymphopenic, because if he's not lymphopenic, that's another strike against COVID. Well, and that's what I mentioned that his his white cell count was actually thirty thousand, and right. that was you know with his acute ischemia, so that's going to complicate that. He does not have splenomegaly. And you uh -huh. said, David, you were seeing a lot of splenomegaly, right? Uh, no, I don't. I didn't say that, but uh, other yeah. people people said that. Okay. Hey, Travis. Travis, while you yeah. were doing that, I just typed in limb ischemia, lung edema in Google, and there are quite a few case reports of what I described, including things like pulmonary leukosequestration induced by hind limb ischemia and some other things like that. So I think it's a thing. I think we may be seeing that. Yeah. Do you um do you have something you want to can you share? Are there any images or or if you keep looking? No, I'm just I just went to Google and I just that's, typed in. Okay. So it's a it's a form of permeability edema, presumably without I don't have the time to read it, but it's really interesting yeah. that huh. someone talked about I don't think we should I don't think we should call this edema. Let's call this lung injury. This is not edema. Yeah, yeah lung injury. Yeah, pulmonary. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah, a form of, of yeah. yeah. 
Travis, did they, uh, did they do an angiogram on him? Did he have anything that looked like Weber's disease? They, that's a good question. Well, this, the thing is they didn't do anything because they were worried about COVID. And so I don't know what, you know, he, he went to isolation and it, you know, because they were so worried based on the, the lung findings, they have not done a catheter angiogram as far as I'm concerned. That, that follow-up image I showed was from the more recent repeat runoff that they did. Yeah, just wondering if uh, if there's uh, there's some overlap between Bregers and, and autoimmune disorder, and maybe he's got an underlying connective yeah. tissue disease. Yeah, and I and I don't think he had renal disease either. You know, which I, I, vasculitis is certainly a good thought. Again, I, I think we're we're thinking non-infectious causes of this lung injury pattern. But you've got so. but you've got you've got thrombi sitting there. In this case, I don't think that this is Bregers disease doesn't doesn't imply these big thrombi, does it? No, it's burgers is more of a, it's a thrombotic microangiopathy, right? Micro. It was small and medium sized vessels. Yep. Look at uh, JAMA, February 17, 1989, for a description of this phenomenon. Okay. All right. Well, I, one question, Travis, in this guy is why does he have these big thromb, these big arterial thrombi? Um, what was? Don't know. What, he's he's, he's an that? active smoker. Don't know. Yeah. That's a very good question too. I don't know. And I guess one one question is, did he have um, did he have a um, <clears throat> a PFO or something like that? Did these thrombi get there from? Right. For Paradoxically, I mean, he does not have any pulmonary embolism, and I don't think on this, you know, it's a, it's an angiogram, it's arterial phase, but he certainly didn't look like he had any big dilated deep veins to suggest. And in fact, you can see some, yeah, you know, some venous filling on the right. Obviously, we're not going to see any on the left since the arteries are out. Yeah, I think those are all good thoughts, and we don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's not COVID. Travis? Yeah. Hey, uh, one other question I had is about that case is, um, did you guys do any follow-up radiographs? Um, I mean, in, other, in other words, did, did, you get, did you think it's evolving at all, the opacity? Is, there were a couple radiographs, I thought, compared to the CT. The one radiograph I saw a couple days ago looked pretty similar. This uh -huh. is the CT, this is a repeat runoff CT yesterday. And you can see, at least at the lung bases, you know, it's, I, I think that there's a little bit less ground glass and a little bit more organization and, and yeah. consolidation. So I think it's evolving. It's it's organizing lung injury at this point. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the COVID cases that I've seen have pretty significant over one or two days. You can notice a pretty significant change. Actually, I actually had a radiograph, which I called negative uh, a few days ago. And then the following day, it was a lot more consolidation. On yeah. it. So from, from what I've seen, I think they're, they're kind of evolving pretty quickly. The the uh, acute lung injuries so yeah here's one another patient and this is a a a patient who is undergoing chemotherapy for for uh, colon cancer and last he's on full theory right now and the last treatment was on the 12th so three days before he came in diarrhea cough dyspnea fever and you know same thing and you can see at this case, at this point, this is several days after that radiograph. And I think it's another nice example of just organizing lung injury at this point. So you see a lot of ground glass. You see maybe a few little nodular areas of consolidation. He's got the dilated airways in these areas. As you can see, this little bit of varicoid appearance to them and small effusions as well. So this is another patient now. COVID negative times three. And I think this is probably just due to the full theory that the patient is currently on. So again, struggles here, because the other risk you run is these patients are immunosuppressed and they're getting put in the isolation ward with the patients that have the disease, you know, that are confirmed to have it, which, you know, is a different issue in its own right. Uh, there are certainly case reports in, of lung toxicity from full theory and so I think this would fit with that. Also, viral panels were negative and everything else. So I was the other night I was, my mom is not a physician. Jeff's actually met my mom a couple of times in, in Reston. 
but she um, was watching the news and she was asking me about all these broken glass opacities that we're seeing <laughs> on CT. And I kind of, I kind of like, I kind of like broken glass for uh, for organizing phase of acute lung injury. When you start to get the reticulation and some of the uh, the dilated airways here, yeah. I don't know, Jeff. I think uh, you're good at signs and stuff. I think we should uh, we should think about that one. Yeah, that's a fun one. Well, I think this highlights the problem, and you know, this is what we're all running into. And um, yeah, you know, the the recent uh, RSNA recommendations provide some framework to use this, whether people adopt them or not. I'm, you know, I think, um, you know, if we said early on before even we were just seeing the first cases from China coming out that it looks like our first response was it looks like organizing pneumonia or, or some acute lung injury. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah, for those that are watching and just, you know, not, you know, not doing chest full time like we are, I think a, a few clues here. When you're looking for organizing lung injury, like you would see with this, I think looking for these dilated airways that are not only a little bit larger than they should be, they're not just air bronchograms, but they start to get this kind of varicoid appearance to them. And it's not really true bronchiectasis in the sense that this may be reversible uh, in these, but I think that's a helpful clue. Now, in this case, there are small effusions. Could there be a component of, of volume? Maybe, but there's not significant septal thickening. And, and you have even a little bit of, of subplural areas that are clear. <clears throat> and we'll keep going with this one then. So this is a patient who had a liver transplant 12 years ago, came in febrile, has effusions, and also has at this point in time on the 16th, has a nice look for, for organizing pneumonia. It's peribronchovascular some areas of perilobular consolidation. It's fairly symmetric. It's affecting the right lung greater than the left. This one we were all pretty confident was going to be was going to be COVID, especially in this in this setting. Another mm -hmm. one now, I mean this is the nice thing, Jeff, you always have confirmed viral cases of pneumonia. I think your virology or microbiology lab is always very good at isolating things. Uh, this this was this patient a few days later, and you can see they've evolved. So this is a typical evolution of of organizing pneumonia, organizing lung injury. And now you can see very similar to that last case, the broken glass at this point, if you will, <laughs> these dilated airways, just a lot of ground glass opacity, the the reticulation, and you know the first two COVIDs were negative in this one. The ID folks were discussing with me. Certainly in transplant populations, and Jeff wrote a paper, what, how many years ago now, Jeff, in AJR on pneumocystis? Uh, it's been a while. It's been a while, it's hasn't been, it? But yeah. that's, you know, that's one never to forget about, especially in patients that have any sort of immunosuppression. And with this look, it would certainly fit. The effusions could be due to, to heart failure. This was not pneumocystis. And the only thing they've isolated in this case is a CMV PCR. And it's not as high as they normally expect, but again, that's the best thing we have going right now would be CMV. And certainly this is a type of, of appearance you would see with CMV, at least in my limited experience in seeing CMV pneumonia. Do you guys agree? Yeah. Yeah. It, this oh. is pretty overwhelming. So Travis, is he intubated at this point on 322? No. So that's and, argument against pneumocystis with yeah. integrated lung disease uh, pneumocystis people are always always intubated hmm. that's a that's a good point uh this was the radiograph in fact more recently still not intubated still has that very coarse look of of just lung injury so i can stop there okay Let's let Peter show his case. Figure, figure it'd be a good week to show some cases of lung injury, and we're getting a bunch of it right now. Yeah. All right. I got to find Peter now. Where is he? <laughs> there he is. All right. Can you guys see my screen or not yet? Not yet. Not yet. 
Yeah, maybe this is my first time trying it from home and I didn't download the app, so it's not letting me share. So maybe it won't work, I guess. Well, if you do you want to log off and do that, I can show a couple cases while you and then connect again. Uh, yeah, so basically, I should just download the app instead of yeah. trying to log, log, log off in. and then just log back in. Okay. All right, I'll, okay. Sh I'll show a case real quick. Sure, go ahead. I got a couple cases too, Jeff, if you want. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm sorry, who was that? I can't. Brian. That Brian? Brian. Oh, there you are. Yep. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Okay. So this is a seven year old uh, kid, uh, totally healthy, drop dead. Um, uh, I think he's like walking or running at gym. Uh, bystander CPR pretty soon thereafter, brought to the ER. This is chest radiograph not too soon after getting to the ER. Bilateral pneumothoraces, extensive pulmonary edema. Um, he went on from there to get a chest CT, kind of nonspecific. You can see some uh, post, some dependent uh, consolidation and uh, lots of uh, airway, lots of lung opacities. Not really sure what it was, um, but totally normal uh, infectious markers. Um, and uh, elevated troponins, so they brought them to the cath lab. I don't have those images, but they had a really hard time engaging the left main. And they were worried that there was an anomalous course. I told them obviously there, there wasn't um, uh, because you can see it well even on this non-gated CTA. Um, despite that, they persisted. They were still worried. So they went on. Uh, the kid continued to decline. So now you can see this is uh, three days later. He's now on veno arterial ECMO. Um, this is the, the venous cannula um, drawing blood out. And this is the left common carotid cannula uh, pushing blood back in. Um, his EF was less than 10% at this time. Um, and in the cath lab, they had a really hard time engaging the left main. Uh, they had to call multiple different uh, uh, in interventional cardiology attendings and still couldn't. After about an hour and a half, they finally got it. So they were worried there was something wrong with the left main. Um, so now they wanted to do a CT angiogram on this kid who was on veno arterial ECMO. And I think Peter showed a case uh, a few months ago of someone on veno arterial on uh, on ECMO who you get a who you wanted to get a CTA pulmonary angiogram on, and uh, so it's a little different in terms of the, the the dynamics in this case because this kid we we couldn't take him off of ECMO. So ordinarily, you you would try and decrease the flow um, and, um, and 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 or turn the the ECMO machine off entirely, which you can't do for this this kid because his EF was so low. Um, so instead, we were forced to do kind of a, a different technique where we injected into the ECMO cannula. So here's a picture of uh, just a general schematic of what an ECMO machine looks like. Um, here's the venous return, uh, venous uh, blood coming in. It's probably part of the oxygenator unit. This is the arterial blood coming out. Somewhere on this device, I think maybe maybe this guy right here, um, is where you can inject into, um, and it'll go through a filter and then come back after the arterial port. So what we ended up doing was injecting into that port, uh, which is nice because it helps clear out any bubbles from the line. Um, I'll show you. Um, this is, these are images from the, uh, the the enhancement curve. Unfortunately, we picked it a little bit too early, um, and we ended up with um, a phase that was. Let's see, so here, this is the the first the first run. Um, you can see. The, the, so again, we're injecting uh, into the left common carotid artery, um, and we've set an RO, uh, we set the ROI in the ascending aorta. So here, um, we, I saw these images and I said, okay, we need to repeat these. Uh, we were probably about a second too early or two seconds too early on that one. This was uh, the immediate repeats, um, and now you can see there's, uh, now we're a little bit later, um, but there's quite a bit of motion. It was, it was hard to time things with this kid. Uh, they were giving him a, a boluses of Presidex that were intermittently bringing his heart rate down to zero. Um, and then uh, after a while, his receptors became saturated um, and his heart rate uh, jumped to over 90. Um, so uh, this was an interesting case. He ended up going to the OR. Um, and in the OR, they found that the left main ostium was uh, completely covered by a little hood of accessory tissue. So even though the, it's arising from the left coronary cusp in the normal fashion, there is a redundant layer of endothelial tissue that would intermittently flop over and cover 
the left main ostium. Um, and, uh, and that's probably what, what happened in him and why he presented with acute MI. Um, this was his chest radiograph uh, about 10 days later um, after the surgery, so nearly completely cleared. Um, uh -huh. So that was an interesting case, just, just in terms of how to, how to do a, a, a coronary CT angiogram on a kid on complete veno-arterial ECMO. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Brian, had he had yeah. symptoms before? Had no, he ever had no. chest pain or exercise intolerance? No, no, totally, totally normal, developing, developmentally normal uh, seven-year-old participated in all kinds of normal activities. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we had talked to my, I talked to my interventional cardiologist. Uh, he had seen one other case in the last, like in his 30 year career, um, where they found that finding on autopsy. So a similar case where he had a, that case, um, that kid died actually in the, in the cath lab because they couldn't engage the left main, um, and the kid was, uh, crumping. Um, and th in this case, the, we suspect the kid did better because of the, the early, uh, transition to, to high intensity ECMO. Um, so the second case, kind of a, another, uh, pediatric. Um, this is a 19-year-old with a full Fontan circulation, um, which you can see here. Here's the SVC coming into the MPA. Here's the IVC coming into the MPA. Um, so the, the systemic venous return completely bypassing the heart. So I, uh, we talked about the, this uh, a couple of weeks ago, but a lot, one of the problems with these, these people is they often develop uh, systemic uh, to venous uh, collaterals, um, or which is a right-to-left shunt, which can cause uh, hypoxia. Um, and so we've been kind of experimenting with uh, this special kind of uh, MRA sequence that GE has. GE uh, lovingly calls it the TRIX, uh, which are the TR, that stands for Time Resolved uh, MRA. And so these uh, uh, are multiple different phases of that. Uh, uh, it, the overall, we, we acquire about 90 seconds. Um, and uh, th these are subtraction uh, coronal uh, 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 isotropic uh, MRA images of, of the, the chest. And um, what's nice about this, uh, besides the fact that you get the multiple different phases, is you can start seeing things in a little bit more time resolved fashion. And so as we scroll through these, um, the subtraction probably makes the left, uh, the left upper extremity uh, injection harder to see. But you start seeing a blush of contrast here, um, both uh, within this, this venous structure um, and uh, also within the left superior pulmonary vein, and I think also within the left uh, pulmonary artery as well. And you can, you can see it gets more and more prominent as you go into different uh, phases um, of the subtraction uh, coronal MRA. So this one I think shows it pretty well. Um, and if you do a, a 3D um, uh, axial or an axial reconstruction, you can see, so here's the connection with the left superior pulmonary vein, and you can track this back up um on let's see a little bit later um you can maybe this one shows a little bit better you can you can track it uh and it looks like it's coming off the left uh superior intercostal vein i think this is it right here coming down um and then going uh going into this this fistula so this is uh probably the left superior intercostal vein um that's fistulized with the left upper pulmonary vein um uh, so a, a systemic venous to pulmonary venous uh fistula. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think that there might also be a, a fistulous connection with that left um, pulmonary artery as well. Um, on a, on a anatomic images, you can see that the central portion of that vessel is, is fairly diminutive. And then uh, right around here, um, uh, it, it gets much larger. Um, and uh, you can see that there's asymmetric uh, uh, contrast filling of that vessel um, on these images. So that's it. Awesome, thank you. Thank so, you. Brian, may I ask a, a sure. naive question? When they took that, that former patient, the seven-year-old, to the OR, yeah. what were they looking for? Um, what did they uh, expect? Uh, they expected a coronary anomaly. So it was a, it was a kind of a, a heady discussion with, with our surgeon in terms of what, what the outcomes were. But uh, based, we had a hard time reconciling the cath lab images uh, or the cath lab uh, where they couldn't engage that left main with uh, the CTE, uh, which clearly shows uh, uh, that it's arising from the left coronary ostium in a normal fashion. Um, and so they were expecting something else. Um, but since he had a totally normal um, uh, inflammatory markers, 
Um, you know, we, we were thinking that this was very unlikely to be uh, myocarditis. We couldn't, uh, couldn't think of another reason why a seven-year-old, otherwise healthy kid would just kind of drop dead. Um, so it was, it was an exploration for that. But they had to they had to open the aorta to to make that diagnosis, didn't they? I mean, they yes. normally normally in doing a coronary and, bypass, they wouldn't have to cut into the aorta. Um, for I yeah, I, I think given the fact that we were so concerned about the left main osteum, that was where they they directed their attention to first. Got it. The, All right. Anything on echo? I mean, you would think that a TEE they might. See something? I'm just curious, even in retrospect, if they went back and looked to see if there's anything there that they could see. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that they may have thought that maybe there was a little bit of an acute angulation, but um, but otherwise, no. I mean, you can see it arises from the left cusp. Um, it it um, I, I wish I had the surgical images, but um, I can show you. Um, it's it's it was just a, a very thin uh, uh, piece of tissue, probably less than a centimeter um, in 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 dimension. Um, that was just kind of flopping over and covering that left coronary ostium. Amazing. Like, a, like they called it a hood. I think you need to, uh, you, you should describe this and you should take credit. This should be uh, Goldner disease. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I add something? Uh, sorry, guys. Didn't introduce myself when I joined. This is Nick Burris at University of Michigan. Hey, Nick. Nick, what's going on? Hey, Sorry, as an aortic imager uh, by trade, I just wanted to raise a question about whether anyone thought there was a little bit of a flap on that um, on that image in particular in the root. Yeah, you mean more uh, to the to the right this side, was a right there. CTA, uh, CT done. It wasn't even done during the arterial phase. Um, and sure. it was, uh, this this uh this I think is just a pulsation artifact, but, but a great question. I, I agree with you, and I think that would be my first thing thought as well. But if you look around, I mean, yeah, there, yeah. All right, sorry. As as you scroll, it kind of makes it a bit more evident. But we've seen a couple instances of cases now, not in kids this young, where there's a limited dissection, um, where there's a non-propagating intimal tear, and then you get this kind of intimal and tussusception effect um, that can variably heal by the time they actually get in there and, and operate on it. So um, maybe it was, you know, something that was uh, more of an acute event and that would maybe explain why he was otherwise healthy and normal and never had any sequela of this previously. Nice. Nick, yeah. this, Nick the CT reminds me of the, the one you read when you were a fellow on the ECMO. Yeah. You, you remember that one? uh there's been a lot i it feels like i don't know i don't remember the specific one you're talking about but the one that you stumped me on the flow because you just showed a couple of images and didn't tell me the patient was on ecmo <laughs> yeah these are never fun when i get called to do these these are uh always challenging but um i i do wonder that like we've had again this is a kid and mostly i've seen this in adults we've had a couple limited intimal tears that have um presented like this that were hard to dif uh, di uh, yeah. diagnose CT. Have you seen those with otherwise normal aortas? Because I remember one from residency and it was a it was a patient who was doing yoga in front of, it was like a 20 year old guy who was doing yoga in front of the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. And it turned out he had Marfans, but had a very localized tear. And it was you know, back when we had like a four row scanner or something, it just looked right. like spaghetti strings at the root. I, yeah, I mean, I, the ones that I've seen have all been in the ascending or proximal arch, and they have all been in reasonably non-dilated or normal-ish aortas. And there's a series in Jack, I think, in, a couple years ago from Dominic Fleischmann's group um, that had 24 patients that kind of had a similar observation. Makes you wonder about some sort of undiagnosed collagen disease or something. I'm worried, I mean, in this particular kid, and I, I, I grant that the surgical findings sound pretty definitive, but it, it does make me wonder if he's going to go on to have something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But Okay, let's let Peter go before the hour is up here. Good discussion. Thanks, guys. All right, Peter, you should be able to share your screen. There we go. All right, you guys can see it? Yep. All right, this case is a little bit less complex. Than the other ones um, but uh, so 
Actually, I can't see my mouse now. There it is. It... Okay, okay. So uh, chest radiograph and there's this abnormality here. So this is an example of a incomplete um, border sign. So you can see a very clear demarcation here between the lung parenchyma and this opacity here. And then the border here is very obscure with the with the chest wall. Um, and so here's the lateral. And actually, if you look more carefully, there's um, there's this um, tubular opacity here, uh, which is more subtle, extending towards the midline. So I'll show the CT. Connection is not very good from. Peter, we're losing the audio. Oh, I, I wasn't speaking right now. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Okay. I was trying to adjust my images. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. So here is the uh, here is the uh, abnormality that we're seeing on the radiograph. So this is actually it looks like a, a graft, and that's what it is. So it's a large uh, oversown side graft, uh, which is coming off of the ascending thoracic aorta, and it's terminating in the chest wall. And here you can see this hyperdensity right there is the uh, the suture material at the end of the oversown side graft. And so it was kind of puzzling for me why they had this graph there. Uh, and you look back at their prior radiograph. So this is a prior radiograph um, on the right side from um, December. Uh, the patient had an MI, and this is right after they did the uh, three vessel cabbage. And um, they have this impella device here. So in retrospect, if you look at where this impella device, usually they put them in through the retrograde through the aorta or sometimes through a subclavian artery. And this has a very um, abnormal approach here. So that was basically um, that side graft was placed uh, intraoperatively to place this uh, impella, which I hadn't seen before. Wow. So does, is the graft shut down now? Yeah, and then this, so they they went back in a few days after uh, after the patient kind of recovered hemodynamically and to take out the impella, and then they uh, pull up the CT again, and then they sutured up the end of the graft and kind of just left it in the in the chest wall. Um, so it's a large uh, oversaw side graft. I see side graft. I remember last week. I don't remember if it was Seth or Howard showed a. A side graph, though. Mm -hmm. so. so basically, this is just a transthoracic approach to get to the aorta for an impeller device. Oh. I just, it's hard to know. They just push the lung aside or something. And it's yeah, but, and I, I'm not, I didn't understand. I read their op report. I didn't completely understand why, uh, why they had to put in such a large graft in there, such a long graft into the chest. Well, because they were in, they were there for a, a cabbage, so the chest was open. The aorta was exposed. Uh, Can you make a sagittal on that CT, Peter, just to see where the lung goes? Uh, and I'm assuming that it, they just have put it anterior to the lung, and then some of it just herniated in front of that right there. Uh, the lung, the What's the fastest way to build the sagittal off? To of the this? right, uh, there's a little sideways looking head on your toolbar. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 If you did. Good. So I, I deleted the sagittal and I, I just kept the coronal. And then that's the. There you go. Not, not way. I just it's, it's, it's anterior to the. It's, so it's basically anterior to the, to the long. Uh, I remember I was looking at that. I was actually look, checking for that on the. I think you're on the wrong side there. You're on the wrong side, yeah. You got the left heart there. You can grab the slider at the top too. Sure. So the earliest exams were uh, a CT of the abdomen, 716. There it is, right there. Yeah, so it just kind of yeah. dents on the lung like a pearl drain would. Right. Yeah, so they must have put it. 
they must have put it uh, extra plural then. Yeah. Cracked along. Okay. I have not seen that. That's pretty cool. That's all I got. All right, guys.